All right, what's going on, everybody? We're a little bit early getting kicked off for another MakerPad, another MakerPad uh, workshop. Typically, we run these multiple times a week. They're always, uh, if not almost always, free to attend. Um, if you ever want to watch a playback, you know, feel free to, to email us or reach out. Um, but joined by my friend here, Jay Klaus, uh, to talk about podcasting. Jay, how's it going? It is so good, my friend. Well, I mean, it's definitely been better, but <laughs> yes, um, things, things generally been pretty good. Relatively pretty good. <laughs> Agreed. Uh, do people want to chat us to, to let us know that the uh, microphones are working, that you can hear us? Um, and I always like to just check in, um, you know, where are people calling in from? Obviously, we're all, most of us are probably home. <laughs> hey, uh, what's up, Reagan? But uh, cities, you know, it's always interesting just to see. I'm personally in L.A., um, Jay is in Columbus, Ohio. Hey, Beautiful, Annette. sunny Columbus, Ohio. Hey, Alex. Ah, Barcelona. I love Barcelona. What's up, Tomas, Germany? Awesome. Jamestown, Ohio. Yes. Another What's up, Ohio Joe? Folks. I'd love to see some friends in here. This Mike's sound great. great. Yeah. So uh, throughout this entire conversation, people are definitely free to ask questions. There is actually a feature that lets you ask questions. Um, and see what other people are asking and uploading them. So I recommend that you use that uh, when you pose your questions to Jay. Um, and we're going to save probably 30 minutes, you know, the back half of this just to, to answer any Q&A. So definitely feel free to, to shoot those over to me. I will help field them. Um, and yeah, I'm really happy to have Jay here because Jay just launched his second uh, podcast, uh, which is already going really well, called Creative Elements. And is it like the Creative Elements podcast, your Creative Elements show? So I'm trying to get myself out of the habit of saying podcast generally. Um, I found that calling something a show makes people take it more seriously. Um, but there's also this question of like, well, what is the medium that this thing exists in? So um, sometimes when I'm talking about it, introductor, introductory, yeah. <laughs> uh, I'll say the Creative Elements podcast. But Amazing. yeah, I just, call it, I just call it Creative Elements whenever I can. Yeah, and he's he's got another show called Upside FM, which covers uh, startups outside of Silicon Valley. Um, you know, yeah, maybe you want if you want to link up the other podcast, but he's been running that for uh, some time now, and I've seen firsthand his process. Uh, to me, was always really interesting because anytime I talk to Jay and I ask him about the show, he's always like, "Oh yeah, we're booked out through July." <laughs> like, it, there's always so much like sort of space and room, and to me, that signals that. Um, his process is pretty dialed in. So we're going to jump into Airtable. Uh, we're going to jump into Otter, which maybe some of you have heard of, uh, and some other tools to kind of connect that up, uh, that all up. Um, thanks. Thanks for the note, Clay. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, Jay, maybe if you want to talk some about like starting upside and just like some of the highlights of that, um, and, and you could describe the show if that's a good place to start as well. Yeah. Well, I appreciate what you're saying about, um, are being booked out in production. And I think there's something important to underscore there, which is basically neither of these things are my full-time thing. Um, Upside just started making a little bit of money. Uh, Creative Elements hasn't made any money yet because we have one episode out. Um, you know, hopeful that that show will have some significant uh, sponsor revenue, but these are passion projects for me. And so to have a weekly podcast, and at times Upside has been twice weekly, and now that I have two weekly shows, that's at least twice weekly, having these things going um, and running and having them be high quality and worth doing while also running my other business is um, tough. So having a process in place that is efficient and effective is super, super important, which is why I've built something using all these tools that we talked about in the description. Yeah, I think it's a great framing. So, you know, for most people, the podcast is going to be their full-time thing. For companies, the podcast is just, you know, a piece of kind of what you're pursuing. So I think that's a great framing is why I set up uh, sort of an important uh, process. It's because it lets you still do the show in a high quality way, uh, but also do, you know, other things. So uh, let's, let's talk about, um, yeah, maybe if you want to uh, describe a little bit of like the high level workflow, I feel like that's a good place to start before we dive into like each kind of component. Cool. Awesome. Yeah. And if you guys want to, in the Q and A talk about like, what to think through whether or not you should actually do a podcast. I think that's a really important exercise to work through before you do this, but let's just assume for now that you guys are interested in doing it. 
Yeah. So, or you already have one and you want to clean up the process. Yep. Totally. So, you know, once you know what the format of your show is, that's going to dictate a fair amount of your process. So for me, I realized pretty early on um, with Upside and with Creative Elements that we are going to have an interview show. And to have an interview show, you need to have guests. And so the leading activity for that you know, is making sure that you book guests and then prepare for the interviews. And, and then at the same time, you're going through the entire process of post-production. So the most important, like the heartbeat of this show for me is actually an air table and I'll share, I'll share my screen, not share a media as this thing puts it. My whole process is basically run out of air table here. Um, and I break it down into steps for having an episode totally done. People start out as target guests, then I will send them a pitch at some point. Um, hopefully they interview or they schedule an interview with me and I'll move their card over here. Uh, obviously it's the Kanban view. Um, once the interview is recorded, I move them here. Then it goes into scripting, then into editing, final review, having it scheduled and having it published. So by having all of these labels of the process, this really helps me keep track of being ahead of production and having a ton of guests in flight at any one given time uh, without dropping the ball anywhere. And I'll take notes to myself on these cards, you know, like here's the date that I sent this pitch, almost as if it's a CRM. I run my entire CRM out of here. But here's when I sent the pitch. Here's who the guest is. Um, here's what their element mentioned on the show once we uh, record the interview. Um, I will schedule, I'll show like, the interview date as well as the publish date. And along with this Kanban, I have a calendar to show here are, you know, the dates of all the guests coming up. And those and are so the published if, dates as well, right? It's, these are published. Dates. You have yeah. to kind of pre-plan to, to keep to a schedule. And can you talk about just like setting a schedule in general? Totally. So I do weekly, which is a lot. Um, you would be, surprised maybe how intense it is to publish something weekly if you want it to be high quality. But um, that's why it's really important to set dates of um, interviewing and publication way ahead of time so that, you know, right now with just the interviews I have scheduled, um, I'm published or I have published dates out into June. And there are a few here that I haven't put on the schedule. It's going to be closer to July at this point with what I have recorded, which gives you some peace of mind because usually guests there are going to be times when your guests either don't show up or have to reschedule because they're busy. And especially when you're aiming high for your guests, this may not be the biggest priority for them. So really, really getting out ahead of it and batch interviewing. You know, yesterday I had two interviews. This week I've had four in total. So trying to do a lot up front so that you can slowly work through uh, the stuff you can control even more, which is post-production, scripting, things like that. How receptive are some of these guests? Like, you know, I know on your creative elements show, for example, like you just had someone like Seth Godin on, um, like how receptive are your guests to booking in the days that you sort of want them to, because it seems like to batch, mm. um, you know, that's maybe one thing I'd be worried about is how do you get a bunch of interviews and then, you know, batch them out like that. Totally. Um, pretty receptive, depending on who the guest is, I might bend to them a little bit more, but what I do with that is. I have, uh, I schedule my entire life through Calendly. And so I have a specific podcast Calendly um, that I send out. And I've basically opened up three days of my week to this to be as flexible as possible for them. Um, and these have a lot of times in there, like literally Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, I'm allowing them to book basically whatever is open. So they have a lot of options, which is good. Um, and this, this Calendly has all of the information they would need to know, like once it gets booked, like, Here's the link. Here's what you should prepare before the interview. Here's how to think about this. And it sends a reminder 24 hours beforehand. People are pretty receptive, but I don't just like send a cold email to people and say, hey, I want to interview, schedule it here. I say, hey, I want to interview you. Are you interested in that? And when they say yes, then I'll send them the calendar link to say, great, find a time that works for you. With Seth, um, he was a little bit different in that. I just asked him like, hey, when is a good time in the next couple of months for you? And he said, let's look in November. And I said, I, yeah, I recorded this back in November. Um, he said, let's look in November. And I said, um, you know, here are a couple days, here are a couple times, 
and he picked one. Yeah. But generally so I use, got, I use Calendly. Yeah. So I'm assuming you've got a set sort of ask. So once you've kind of set up an air table, like here, let's say you're starting from scratch, you'd set up kind of this full Kanban view. You'd start with who are all the people that I'm trying to potentially reach. You'd actually maybe book them into a calendar in advance. So it's like every week I want to publish on Tuesdays. Let me just set up that full calendar. So I'm sort of accountable to it. And then you're going to start sending out emails, you know, one by one to uh, get them to say yes and then get them to use the Calendly link. I actually don't put, I don't slot in any guests into the production schedule or like the, the actual publish date until they have recorded the interview. Once their interview is recorded, then I'll think seriously about when the date is that we'll publish it. But if I'm starting to run out of publish, publishable interviews, I need to schedule things first. Once an interview is scheduled, then I can start thinking about slotting it in. But I don't try, I don't predicate my schedule on something that has not yet been confirmed in terms of an interview. Yep. Got uh, two questions here that will pop in. Alex Karpinski asks, we'd love to hear your thought, thoughts on booking guests that are high profile, uh, pitching them scripts, content, uh, getting people that are you know bigger than you are to, to interview. Totally. So my thoughts on getting big name guests is to go for it. Um, and every just like anything else, social proof goes a long way. And so for this show, I knew I wanted to go out of the gates with big guests. And so I basically reached fairly high and um, did an interview with my friend, Jason, who um, has a pretty good following, Jason Zook. Then I took his episode, got cover art done, had like the whole concept dialed in, made a whole prototype episode. And I actually took all of that and pitched it to a podcast network and got them interested in, in getting behind it. And then now that I had a podcast network behind it and I had really good cover art, I had a really good idea, I had a prototype episode, it was a lot easier for me to reach even higher and book some people that uh, were really big names, but I still had a couple points of contact with in the past. Like I had exchanged a few emails with Seth. I had um, met a few times with James Clear. And so I reached out to them first because they felt like warm leads, people that I had at least a couple of touch points with, um, they took a chance on it. And then once you have any of those names, it becomes a lot easier to go to other people and say, here's my show, here's the cover art, here's a work in progress page, here's a synopsis, here's uh, a couple of the people that are doing it already. Because people will use all those heuristics to decide, like, is this something I want to take a chance on? But generally, podcasting is still early enough that people are like super open to doing it. They just love that people want to talk to them and they love talking. Yeah. So it's like a really low risk thing for them. It's all audio. They just have to show up and sound like they know what they're talking about. And it's pretty much only upside for them other than like the 30 to 60 minutes of their time. So do it like reach high early, because if you don't, it's going to be harder to actually get those big names later because they're going to look at your guest list. So the earlier that you reach high and get a couple of big names, the better off you are. Yep. Smart. I think it's interesting that you also uh, got the podcast network involved before you'd published anything. So you actually just published your first show, but you'd recorded a bunch uh, prior to that. And I think that's an interesting you know, way of going about it. Maybe we can talk more about podcast networks at the end. I think Jay's pretty knowledgeable about the podcast space in general. Um, so we can, we can touch on that. Uh, another question here. Do you have any thoughts on the pros and cons of video recording your, your podcasts? Only pros. Really no cons other than if your guest has a bad connection and then you can tell them to turn it off. But I am like 100% on the Squadcast train. I'm going to send you in the chat my Squadcast referral link. Squadcast is like the best podcasting tool that I am aware of uh, because it records, you can record remotely, but it records your audio and the guest audio locally on your device. So you're getting the highest quality input from whatever their input device is and it gets delivered to the host. So like if you listen to the episode of Creative Elements with Seth, he literally showed up in a sound booth. He had a sound booth and a microphone and a cup of coffee. And it sounds like we're in the same room. His audio is better than mine, un unbelievably. So um, the reason that video helps a lot is uh, it's just a lot easier to have a personal connection. I've used Zencaster in the past. And besides my audio engineer telling me that Zencaster was trash and the audio coming out of it was actually really bad. Um, it was, we just didn't feel connected to that guest like we do with others when you can have a face to face interaction and see people's eyes and you can smile and have body language in it. You can actually ask deeper questions and have a better interview And Squadcast doesn't record the video. It just has a video feed. So 100% can't recommend Squadcast enough. Use video. 
it has a much better output outcome. And a lot of people getting into podcasts anyway, they're doing it as a means of building relationships with people they want to meet and learn from. And it's just so much faster with video than not. Yeah. Yeah. I think uh, audio tends to be more important as well. And so I think like, I mean, even now I know like our connection is probably not perfect, you know, in terms of HD, but uh, when the audio quality is good, when you have a good microphone, um, I think for video interviews, it, it still makes a big difference. Um, Clay asks if uh, Seth drank the coffee and then we'll, we'll move on to uh, some other things. Did, <laughs> did, did Seth drink the coffee? He did drink the coffee. It was, it was so funny. He, he clearly does so many of these things because I showed up and I always have this opening spiel of like, here's what you need to know about the show. And I try to prepare them. And he was just like, I got it. Let's go. <laughs> <laughs> nice. L let's talk about prep then. So, um, yeah, we know that you've, you sort of already described that Calendly um, helps you sort of prep the guests. So you exchange an email, you reach out to that high profile person, you start at the top of the ladder, right? Uh, you get them to book the show, you, um, you send them your Calendly link so they can book in a specific amount of times, which lets you batch your interviews. You can do more than one per day. That helps you get ahead of schedule. Calendly sends them what and then what else do you do to prepare your guests and and then we'll get to what do you do to prepare for your shows calendly can share pr pretty much anything that you want um and you can do that in the body of the event let me pull up my script yeah it'd be cool to see like an outline or or what it sends sorry if you guys are hearing the cat outside my door sounding very sad that he can't be in here right now <laughs> Okay. Um, do, do, do. Back to yeah. And thanks for the here. questions, everybody. We can, like I said, we can keep kind of fielding those on the fly. Maybe if people want to say, actually, I'll I'll do a little poll here real quick. Um, curious about what stage you're at. Um, so let me type that out, and Jay, you can go ahead again. I'll I'll add a poll to the to the chat. So I only ask a couple of questions in the scheduling process because the most important thing is that they schedule a time and it's on their calendar. So I ask their name, their email, phone number in case of emergency, which is not required, and anything else I should know, which again is not required. When they uh, confirm, I have a calendar event and an email that says Creative Elements Podcast, your name and my name. Hey, thanks for coming on Creative Elements. I'm excited to speak with you and learn more about your story. All you need to do is click the squad link, Squadcast link below at our interview time. A large part of our conversation will focus on one or more of the elements of your work that you feel have allowed you to build a successful career. Um, here are some examples. Here's that Squadcast link. Last thing, if you have a USB or professional microphone that you can use, that would be fantastic. If not, please use corded headphones or a microphone if possible, AirPods as a last resort. And they'll get a reminder 24 hours ahead of time that has exactly that same information. On Upside, we used to send a shorter confirmation uh, that just gave them a link to this pre-interview page to basically say what to expect as a guest. We asked them to fill out a couple questions. Maybe 40% of them did that. But here's like a checklist. And it depends on who you're interviewing too. If the people you're interviewing have experience with interviews, they need less guidance. If they're new, you might want to tell them things like plug your computer into a charger. Um, put your devices on. Do not disturb. Close programs that may slow you down. Sit near a router. Like we used to record on Skype and it was unbelievably difficult to get founders used to how to use Skype. They didn't remember the username. Um, the signal was terrible. So I would err on the side of more information, but if you're going to try to give them a big checklist, maybe link it to a page on your website that they can go read on their own. Yeah. Talk, talk to me about when they jump on pre-call. Uh, how do you, you know, you said you had this spiel for Seth. He didn't really need it. Uh, but like for anyone else, and I think maybe for Upside um, specifically, because uh, for those uh, of you who don't know, I think one thing about Jay's Upside podcast, which is also um, really well produced, like it's just a super high quality show, is you're really good about the organization aspects of it. So like the show itself has set components. So And maybe you can even talk about those components. Um and then circle back to the question I had, which is like, how do you prep somebody for what you're about to sort of go through in the show? Upside is actually more difficult to produce from a logistic standpoint because we have two co-hosts. So the format of the show is uh, we are exploring early stage high growth companies that are not based in the Silicon Valley. So we talk to founders, we talk to investors, we talk to community builders. We're exploring communities and companies and investors that are not based kind of in the epicenter of tech. 
Um, and the show has three segments, especially on our standard episodes with founders. In the intro, we introduce the company. We share a little bit of our research on the company, and that's about six, seven minutes. Then for the next 35 or so minutes, we interview the founder as if we were angel investors. And then the last 15 minutes, my co-host and I debrief and basically do what is called a quote unquote deal memo, where we talk about what we liked about the company, what we think about the deal, um, some things that we still had questions about, et cetera. So when we talk to founders, when we get them on the call before we hit record, we let them know, we say, all right, we're going to talk here for about 45 minutes. Um, we have full post-production. So if you need to pause and consider an answer, if you want to start over, you can do that. Just call it out. We'll take care of it in post-production. Um, we tell them that if they need to get a glass of water, or use the restroom, they can do that. We tell them the first question we're going to start with before we hit record. And then we ask them if they have any questions. And then we'll hit record. We'll start with that question and we'll go from there. Yeah. I think it's really helpful to say what the first question is. I just know as being a guest on other podcasts, I feel like that would kind of put me at ease. And, and maybe that's something I've seen a little bit in just my time podcasting is like, obviously, if you can put the guest at ease and show that you're organized, um, I think that probably goes a long way for just like kicking off. Right. Um, and also, so, uh, I also want to okay. say beginning when you before you hit record is a really good chance to build the comfort that you want your guests to have anyway. Like, even if you take the first 10 minutes talking with someone and don't record it, it helps you build a little bit of rapport. So it's easier to get into these questions anyway, because if you're interviewing, I like to think of your, your questioning, your line of questioning as sort of like an arc of intensity. You want things to be pretty easy. And then as the time goes on, you can ask more intense questions and get a little bit deeper. And then you want to plane down from that so they can have a good like ending experience too. And if you want to start that arc of intensity, even before you hit record, because you know, you want to get deep, um, you can do that and then just, you know, kind of record from some, some more yeah. in, intentional and intense questions. Yeah. Um, awesome. I want to get to, uh, Otter in a little bit. I also want to get to finding an editor. Um, uh, just two quick questions that we'll do before that. Uh, what equipment do you recommend to purchase mic, video cam, uh, et cetera, is, is the first question. Um, I'm just using a MacBook Pro here. And the one thing that probably you should know is audio files are pretty big. Uh, you want to send WAV files or AIFF files to your editor, which can be pretty large for, for, um, for a fully produced show in waveform, it's about half a gig. So I have a MacBook Air here that's 250 gigabytes. I have it totally synced up and backed up to Dropbox. Um, camera doesn't really matter. I'm just using the standard camera that's in the MacBook Pro, um, which is probably pretty good. But since you don't record video, it doesn't really matter. Um, as far as mic goes, I'm using a Blue Yeti microphone here. They're about 130 bucks. This is a Blue Yeti Pro, which I only have because my girlfriend had it and my Yeti broke. So you will replace it um, every couple of years, probably. If you really want to go go after it, um, the microphone you see Joe Rogan use and everybody else is like a Shure FM78, I want to say, which is really good. But that requires another piece of equipment that feeds into your laptop and needs a preamp. And a USB microphone like a Blue Yeti can just go straight into your machine. Yeah, much easier. Um, okay, so another question here from Sean. Ever had a podcast series run away on you? I thought I was making two or three episodes on a local history thing in my neighborhood, and it's turned into a, a documentary. I'm struggling with how to release, wait till the end of its journey, or release one big piece. Do I chop it up into multiple episodes? Yeah, so I mean, this is just like any other project. You know, if you if you continue to build it up in your mind, you don't let it get out there. If you don't have a plan for what it, what good enough and what release looks like, then you're just going to drive yourself crazy because scope will expand forever and then nothing will ever actually get out there. So I think it's really good to have a strong like social contract with yourself and anyone else on your team to say, here's what we need to launch and then like stick to that. You know, Don't let everything go too deep. I'm sure there's an argument to be made, like if you dive into something and there's just like a much more compelling story that you think there's huge opportunity for, I think those are probably exceptions more than rules. It is important to have a good first product in my opinion, but you should know ahead of time, like what a good first product is and what you need to go out and launch with. 
otherwise just like anything else like i said you could you could go crazy with scope creep on your own projects and never actually share it and then what was the point uh, yeah. alex said in the chat real real quick he said headphones mm -hmm. yes or no you you want to be able to i mean you got to hear the guest right so definitely use headphones of some sort because if you don't have headphones their audio is going to come out of the machine and into your microphone and have this horrible feedback that you can't get out so you need to make sure there's no sound going into your microphone other than your voice now i don't know what it is about video podcasts that make people think that like you know and and oh no sorry i lost my you're still here okay yeah it's okay. i don't know what it is talking. like in a video world we we evolved to a point where we wanted it to be non-obvious that this was being recorded like the video world evolved to a point where it's like we should just be able to videotape what it looks like to have people in a room talking to each other and then in video podcasts for some reason now we insert like a microphone in front of everybody everyone's wearing headphones it's just weird looking so if you're not doing a video podcast it doesn't really matter use whatever products are giving you the best results for what you need but the most important thing is keep keep other people's audio from coming into your microphone yeah got another question what promotional assets are you providing the guests and and probably the follow-on to that i'll just add uh oh, jay hopped out uh so let's let's answer that again in a second and i think he'll just hop back in to to fix his uh i'm just gonna invite it back on stage there we go what's up, Sorry jay? About that um, second display got lost all good all good um so uh anyways the question is uh what promotional assets do you provide the guests i just started doing this for creative elements on the upside um in the upside history what we would provide was a link to the show the web page um we would provide uh, a tweet a post on linkedin and a post on our facebook that we use so they could just reshare that easily now with that's was that something you published? Sorry, that you want them to reshare, yeah. or did you just write out the format? Okay, so you guys will share everything, and then you say, "Hey, this is already shared yes, by us." Exactly. On Creative Elements, I'm doing things a little bit different. Of um, little audiograms, I have custom sketches for the guests for each cover of each episode. So I'll share that JPEG of the cover of their episode. I'll share the web page I made for them for their episode. I'll share. Uh, two to three audiograms, which are the JPEG of the cover with the audio underneath it with captions that I made. That's a quick quote from the episode. And that is probably going to be really great. It's too early to tell because I've only had one episode of that show published. But um, I think that's going to be really big for us. But I think the most important thing is having dedicated pages for your episode, um, sharing it on your own channels, and then sending them the links to what you share so they can do a quick retweet if nothing else. Yeah. Yeah. I think the, uh, the unique cover art makes them feel special too. Jay's new show, um, like very much designs that person in the cover art. And I think that it's, it's like very much about the person. And I think that probably helps out a lot. Um, I do want to get to, uh, editing, uh, because I know that's a piece of the process for people. And I want to get to Otter, which is how you translate the, uh, the audio to text. Um, so maybe Jay, if you can just walk us through, we don't need to go through the Upwork thing. Um, but maybe just, you could mention that you found someone through Upwork, uh, but then just talk us through like the editing process and, and how do you like produce a really high quality show from an edit perspective? So the easiest way to do it is to put a constraint on yourself when you go into an interview, you know, if you want to have a 30 minute show, you could interview the guests for 60 minutes and then cut that down to the best 20 to 30 minutes and have a really high quality product. But that's going to take a lot of effort on you to uh, go through and find what 20 minutes you want. And so if you're trying to do this quick and dirty, I think the best way you can do that is by putting a constraint on yourself in terms of how long you allow yourself to talk to the guest so that you can make it easier to edit down. Um, if you do a high quality enough conversation, you can basically take those files. Uh, Squadcast, for example, will give you two or it'll give you one file for each speaker. They are completely synchronized, so you can put them into any um, GarageBand or audio editing platform that you can just put them on top of each other and you have the full interview there. Uh, you can also mix them in Squadcast now. And so what we do then is we will send all those individual files to our audio engineer. Uh, he knows well enough now our preferences. We basically want to take out ums, ahs, filler words. Um, 
and make the audio sound as good as possible. So he does all that for us and he'll stitch on our intro music. He'll stitch on um, our transitions and our ads. He knows the standard format of our show. And so as long as we have all the components to send to him, he can put it all together and, and master it and mix it the way that he wants. For this new show that's a little bit higher production, I am putting myself in a constraint. So I only have 35 to 45 minutes of conversation with them. I take that and I run it through Otter, which is this transcription service. I'll put it into this folder here called Creative Elements. And it's just a raw mix of uh, the conversation itself. And what comes out of that, I'll go down to an episode. This is with. Otter.ai. It's an AI system where you're, it translates audio into text if, if you're not familiar with it. And it's free. It's awesome. They have a very generous free plan. So I'll put in the audio here. It detects different speakers. Oh, and then wow. you can tag that speaker as whoever you want. You know, I said, okay, I define this as Ash. Because I've done this so many times, it already tags me as me. It knows my voice. Um, and then sort of like Descript, you can go in here and edit the text. You can't edit the file directly in here, but you can edit the text and make sure it's got the speakers correctly. But I do this to give myself a rough enough version of the script that I can download it, upload it into a Google Doc, highlight the stuff that I want to take out, um, move it around. You know, if there's something in minute 40 that actually mapped really well to something at minute 15, I'll move that chunk. Um, and then what I do is I make the job easier for my audio engineer by going into GarageBand, arranging the raw files in the order of my script, recording my voiceovers ahead of time, putting that in the same uh, GarageBand file. So basically, he has an end-to-end. -end. Here are all the components of the episode. I just need to mix it and make it sound good and then make all the pacing correct and stitch it all together and get one final file. I do all of that as the producer of the show ahead of time. And that's mostly to save me time and production budget because I've tried scripting it out entirely and highlighting stuff I want to take out and sending the script to an editor. It takes them a lot longer to get through it, which is more money that I'm investing. And also, I tend to have messed something up. So if they follow the script to a T, I'll get something back that isn't even the final file of what I want anyway. And I go back into GarageBand and cut it up. So I'm trying to get the whole thing laid out as close to possible um, with the actual content end to end and then sending that to just get the audio to sound better. Yeah, I think this is kind of like a mindset thing. And obviously that's like an intense process where if you're just starting, you know, maybe just having somebody mix it and edit out like the ums is probably the best place to start. Uh, you found an editor through Upwork. I've also worked with an editor through Upwork. It's it's easy to find people who can can handle that for you. I think what you bring up is, is probably a little bit more advanced, but I think it's an interesting thing to understand, which is I get the sense that you see yourself as like the creative producer of the show as well as the interviewer. And that that makes it almost a little bit more like NPR-ish in the sense that you're trying to tell a story with this interview. And so you're going to go back and I assume you have to listen to the interview afterward uh, again. Totally. Uh, and I, there, there's probably something in there about getting better at podcasting. I So I have a podcast as well. I rarely, if have ever have listened to my own episodes. And I think that's probably a detriment to myself. Um, so I find that really interesting. And yeah, I appreciate you bringing up the script. I think this is, this will be cool to totally. see. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I will probably spend hours listening to the same episode, making sure it's good. And the thing is like, if this sounds like a lot of work and like you don't wanna do it or can't do it, then honestly, it may not be worth doing a podcast because it's getting more and more competitive. Like people have high expectations. It has to be pretty good. So unless you're providing something that is the scarcest knowledge on the planet that people can't find elsewhere, they're not going to tune in if it doesn't sound good and isn't well produced. Something. So I this is an example. Oh, go ahead. Dan. Yeah. Something I didn't um, just think of in general is that I, I didn't realize it would sound good to move parts of a show. Uh, so like, you know, I've done interviews and I didn't know that I could take a clip from like later in the show and move it earlier and still work it in so that it sounds like a natural conversation. I, I actually just had no idea that that was like a, a feasible thing. And you have to play with it. You know, I'm something that I'm trying out more and more with this show is sometimes I don't even have the recording of me asking the question in the interview. I'll go straight into their answer if it's obvious what I asked. Or um, if I love a clip that came later in the show and I don't want to intro it with what I wrote or what I with what I said in the interview, I will write a voiceover to introduce it 
and then we'll go back to the interview. Yeah, super interesting. I think that's another light bulb moment for me. You don't have to record yourself or keep yourself in the episode asking the question. You can just let them jump into new answers. I think that's uh, really interesting. I'm actually looking forward to listening to more of your show, uh, partly just to listen in to kind of hear that. And I hope you know everybody today is is getting a sense of that too, where now you get to start to see a little bit more of the dynamics of of what kind of like an interview show uh, looks like. So Otter, um, I want to chat on for another second here. Are you... Um, are you utilizing that exported text? Like, are you creating a blog post? Are, is it just available for people to read? And how important do you think it is to have text associated with your interviews? I think it's really important. So this folder down here, these are my private workspace folders for both of my shows. These um, mixes are really rough. When I have the full episode produced, I'll put it back into Otter into one of these groups. And the difference is in this group, I have uh, the person I've hired from Upwork who helps with our transcripts. And this will be the final file that she actually goes through and makes sure, makes sure everything is really perfect. And then I export that and I'll put it on the episode pages down here as a transcript. And I have this wrapped in a short code in WordPress so the page doesn't get like super, super long and unwieldy. But um, every episode we've done of Epside, episode I'll do of creative elements. I have a full transcript here. Um, it's not the most highly utilized thing. When people like to use transcripts, they're so grateful that it's here. It is invaluable for me from a production and editing standpoint. But also, it seems to me from upside that it does a lot for our SEO. And so I'm going to keep doing it because I think there is some real search value there. Um, which, you know, I, it's hard to even understand the total upside of that. But since I'm already doing it as part of the process anyway, I wanted to make it available. Yeah, yeah, that's that's good to good to hear. Um, let's uh, let's jump to Transistor for a second because we haven't touched on that at all. Um, so, you know, we, we talked a little bit about and I, I want to get to more Q&A here soon, but we talked a little bit about, um, you know, setting up some initial sort of guest stuff. That's all through Airtable for you. Uh, once you sort of get the guests to agree, they book through Calendly, that sends them some, you know, uh, content that helps them prepare for the interview. We talked about preparing for an interview. Uh, we talked about editing intensely, uh, your interview. Um, and yeah, let's go to hosting for, for a minute. we both use Transistor, so it's good to shout them out. Um, I like Transistor. So yeah, let's go to the episode. Oh, go ahead. I like Transistor. I think it's a really good host. Most, most hosts are pretty much the same. Um, but I like Transistor because I've never had any issue with it. No downtime. Uh, they have pretty good analytics for what's available out there. Um, but I mean, they yeah, go to the episodes thing just so people can see the. Yes, yeah, so it's pretty straightforward. You just add to, to publish and this is to many platforms, yeah. right? you know, and maybe we should talk for a second. Why post to many platforms? We'll just talk about that for a minute. Yeah. If you're not familiar with how the infrastructure of podcasting works, you put it into a host and a host translates all of the data into an RSS feed. That RSS feed is publicly available and it gets picked up by your podcast player, which is called a pod catcher. Any pod catcher can read any podcast RSS feed if it's public. Um, so basically you have to upload once into a host. You have to make sure that the other podcasters are aware that you're sending out an RSS feed. But once you do that one time, Every time you upload an episode to the host, it will automatically push to your feed on all of the different podcatchers. So yep. here in Transistor, when I add a new episode, you just have to have a title, the date you're publishing it. You upload the audio file itself. You can add custom artwork for each episode, which I do on Creative Elements. Um, you have full show notes here, the author, the episode number, any keywords, search, and that's it. You schedule it, and whenever the time comes that you schedule it for, it just goes out to all those players automatically. So it's really easy, actually, to get your show listed and shown in players. You just have to make sure that the podcatchers one time are aware that your show exists. And so sometimes you have to like submit your RSS feed to them, but it's pretty immediate once you do that. Yeah. Um, Reed, to answer your question, yes, this uh, show is available. Just shoot us a note. We can send you a link, and you can rewatch it. Um, Reagan, one second, I'm just going to clear that answer out. Reagan, uh, asks, what are some good metrics to track an industry averages? So yeah, how do you gauge success of your show? And obviously everyone has, does podcasting for a different reason. So I think, 
you know, it really depends on your goals, I'm sure. But yeah, how would you respond? It's to a that? crazy, I mean, it's a, it's a power law, just like anything else. So we on upside, uh, at our peak, we were uh, getting a 1000 trailing 30 day downloads, which put us in I think it was the top 10% of shows. So once you release an episode, if you get a 1000 downloads on that episode within the first 30 days, that would put you in the top percent of all shows, top 10% of all shows. Um, I think the first I think the top 1% is like 10,000, or maybe 50,000. I don't know, but it's an it's an it's a power curve. So you can get you can be pretty well off. I mean, advertisers will really start to take you seriously if you're at 5000 uh, downloads per episode. So I would definitely shoot for that. But more important than your total number of downloads, just like anything else is your conversion. So if you have uh, a really niche audience like upside does upside has an audience of founders, startup employees, um, uh, principals and associates at venture firms. Uh, so our advertisers were uh, a law firm and an executive search firm because they have high priced services for our very targeted audience who can make decisions to buy them uh, in a conversion just like really makes the sponsorship make sense for them. So you can you can get sponsorship with smaller audiences if it is really targeted and they have some buying power. Yep, makes makes sense. Um, so let's let's go to a more open Q and A now. Um, you know, I'm sure there's other things that we could touch on that people maybe want to hear about. Um, I feel like I have some things I'm still curious to hear about. I see something on this list that's called megaphone that we didn't get to. Uh, so maybe we could. Mega talk about that for a second. Megaphone is just uh, another hosting platform and it's probably okay, not, just another option. yeah, it's probably not worth really diving in because, um, I only have access to it because I'm through a network. It's like the Cadillac of hosting platforms. It's pretty expensive, but what's cool about Megaphone is they have programmatic ads. So if you expect that you're going to have good yeah. ad velocity, you can define in the episode where you want ads to appear. And then it tracks the number of impressions or downloads that happen for your show and it will automatically adjust the ads in your entire back catalog if you've gotten the number of listens that you've promised to a sponsor on any particular ad unit. Cool. Uh, Alex asks a good question, especially for you know MakerPad kind of no code, um, you know, focus workshop. Like, how do we integrate Zapier? So, like, let's talk about kind of piecing together these different components. Um, and oh yeah, this is great. Go right to the Zapier. So the Zapier that I, the, the integrations that I have for our podcasts are mostly related to how I manage the Airtable. Um, there's a lot of disjointed moving parts to this. And honestly, I just haven't found an efficient way to really even make simpler the publishing of shows. Now I've chosen to make things kind of complex, right? Not all shows need to have transcripts. Not all shows need to be on WordPress. Um, your host will provide you a website for your show. So it'll automatically be there, but I wanted to make everything look really, really good. And it just makes a lot of small steps places. So I'm still learning how to automate this a little bit more Zapier. What I do right now is, um, in my air table, let me go back to that screen. Yeah, be curious to see that grid view of your Airtable for um, um, Upside. Maybe some of the Zapier stuff there, because okay. I know it's pretty intense. Yeah. In, in Airtable, I have I run my entire CRM in this. And so if you look at this super gnarly, super long master grid of people in my life, uh, some of them filter into what I call partnership prospects. And then I have a checkbox that basically says, are these people a podcast prospect? And if they are a podcast prospect, it moves them into this view. And in this view, um, it will then use Zapier to um, basically put them into this other tab, which is my podcast prospect. So once I checkbox in my CRM, this person's a podcast prospect, they will go into this target list. And then I manage the podcast production the rest of the way through uh, this, this podcast tab. Let me see if there's anything else. Yeah. Any other Zapier stuff? Oh, uh, I also have a full editorial calendar for all the stuff that I do, uh, in Zapier. And so I wanted to include my podcast episodes. So once I add a publish date on this table to an episode, it goes into the editorial calendar that I can manage like all of my 
newsletters and things like that. And what about like Otter or anything like that? There's any integrations with like an Otter or, uh, yeah. It's possible. It's not, it's not something that I've, that I found, unfortunately. Yeah. Maybe something for the future that'd be easy to get an audio to sort of zap the text file or something like yeah. that. Um, cool. Uh, Spencer asks, um, let's talk some about like growth. Uh, and maybe after that, I'd be curious to hear about ratings, uh, as part of that. Um, let's talk about effective growth strategies for, for podcasting. The most tried and true strategies are getting guests that have their own following and are willing to share the show. Hopefully, you know, that's my biggest hope for growth for creative elements. Um, on upside, our guests were startup founders and they typically have an audience of like zero and their company pages have Twitter followings of like 20. So that didn't really work for us there. Um, we eventually got to a place where we have a full marketing checklist now, which I could probably open up in Slack. Yeah. That'd be cool to see. Yeah. Also maybe you just are thinking about this piece, but, uh, Jay and his, uh, co-founder of, of that podcast, uh, have also, um, been kind of out and about, like you did something at South by Southwest. Um, so I feel like you, you both have actually done some good IRL stuff. Um, obviously it's a little bit different now, but, uh, I, would assume that helps with some of the growth too. Yeah. I mean, personal relationships help a ton because anyone with an audience that will share your stuff is a big, big win. Um, our biggest bumps outside of that on upside have been from press coverage. Every once in a while we'll get included in a list of like best business podcasts to listen to or best whatever podcast to listen to. So we now, Eric and I manage all of our communication through us. And so every, every week we have a marketing checklist that we go through, like, um, sending out an email to our list in MailChimp, um, make sure we share the episode on our Twitter, share the episode to our own LinkedIn and Facebook. Then we can send your episode as live email to the guest that has links to those things we shared. We post on a couple of directories like pod hunt and something called Middlebit hacker news. We'll post it on Instagram with our waveform audio things that we do. So we do that for every episode and hopefully, you know, it catches some steam. It's great when guests share, share it themselves. That helps a ton, which is great. Um, but outside of that, something that we're trying with the new, the new show. And part of the reason I went to a network is another way to get uh, new listeners and for growth is for getting your feed shouted out or advertised or placed in the feed of another show. And that's like a real strength for a podcast network because they have a bunch of shows that they help run production and advertising for anyway. So in the podglomerate network, I'm going to have, you know, some quick reads that they'll place as some of the programmatic ads in their shows to say, Hey, if you like this show, you know, check out creative elements, another part of the podglomerate podglomerate network. Some of them might be so gracious. Um, if I interview a host of a show that's in the network, they might put an entire episode in their RSS feed for their show to get people excited about it and they'll go subscribe. Those are some of the growth strategies you can promote um, in certain players too, if you have budget and the relationship to do so. But that's a little harder to access. Yeah. Uh, how, do, how do ratings fit in? Um, like, what's the point of ratings? Does it matter? You know, I just, how do you think about it? To me, ratings matter more than they don't matter. You know what I mean? Like it's more important to have them than to not have them. Are they this huge, huge impact? No, but they are a, a strong so like social signal um, because people use them still as a heuristic. You know, I mentioned that using names early on is a great heuristic to get people to jump in and do it. But if your show has existed for three years and you have 12 reviews on iTunes, people aren't going to think you have a very high listenership. It's a pretty easy line to draw. By contrast, if you are a show just starting out, you know, when Eric and I published Upside, the first thing we try to do is get to 100 reviews on iTunes. And even though a lot of that was our friends, uh, it helped us get some bigger names and climb out of that hole and get people to take us seriously because it's like, oh, well, I know that this show has about 100 ratings on iTunes that's similar or comparable to this show. And I know that show is doing really well. So that helps. But I don't know outside of that what is possible. You know, the 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 thing that is hard to tell, the black box is Apple Podcasts itself. They probably have a beat on some of this and they can tell between ratings, reviews and your actual downloads how well the launch of your show is doing. 
And if it's doing well, that's going to get their attention. And they might, um, they might promote your show then as a new show. There was this myth for a long time that new and noteworthy on Apple was like the best thing you could do. And I don't think that's necessarily true anymore. I think they even stopped doing it for a while. But that bar and all the things you'll read about new and noteworthy just isn't the way it works anymore from my understanding. Yeah, super, super interesting. Um, so got a little bit more time here. Uh, anybody has any questions, feel free to throw them in the chat. Um, feel free to throw them in the question uh, component. I'm trying to think if there's any other pieces of, you know, podcasting that, that we haven't covered. Um, you know, one thing that it made me think that when you were kind of just saying some of that is like looking at the shows that are kind of related to you, that the algorithm is showing you're related to, and maybe you could build a relationship with them with, you know, outside of a network, just do it on yourself, start your own mini network. Um, uh, another question here from Joseph as a show creator, how much do you have to give up to, you know, quote unquote, give up to join a podcast network? How did you evaluate the best network to join? Um, I'm sure it varies network to network. You, the thing that I really didn't want to give up was basically editorial and creative control. And that was not asked for me to really give up. They definitely have opinions on things like how long your show should be. What should the format be like? Um, they really pushed me to do higher production than I was planning on. Um, and I'm glad that they did. Like, I think that's all in all a really good piece of advice, even though it's more time and more resources to put in. But um, the typical things that you'll give up is a percentage of your advertising revenue. They'll take some cut. Um, and it's it's usually not 50-50. It's usually less than 50% that they'll keep. But they go and they find the advertisers. Um, the real benefit to, to me in the beginning was the guidance on how to structure the show. But they also have a lot of relationships. So the marketing of the show up to and through launch, like um, we're going to be we're going to be uh, featured on Stitcher. We are already featured on Stitcher in a small way. We're featured on Castro right now. Uh, we've been in a couple of news publications and that all came from relationships in the network, which has been fantastic. So if they can help get an initial audience early, which they're incentivized to do because then they can sell ads more effectively, then I have no problem giving a percentage of the ad revenue to them. I think that's great. Um, but that's really the only thing that you're sacrificing. Yeah, got another interesting question here. Um, so say you have a podcast that you're going to pivot and take in a slightly diff different direction. Um, would you start over, rebrand your existing show, try to keep your existing subscriber base? How do you handle that? Um, that's tough. Um, hopefully, you know, if it's, if it's still the same hosts, then it's going to be easier than if like you pick up a show that had existed before and had an audience and you're really doing a hard pivot. But at the end of the day, you're putting so much time and effort into this. Do what you want to do. Um, you know, share an episode to talk about why you're doing it. And some people will, will definitely come with you. Um, would you start over a rebrand your existing show or try to keep your existing subscriber base? I would certainly try to keep it. Um, if you're, if that show is not going to continue in the form that it was, it's probably worth rebranding and trying to keep using that audience and that stream, you'll lose some people and that's okay. But if it's close enough, then I would keep doing it. Some of the guys in the, the podglomerate network are rocketship.fm. And they've done a ton of episodes. They've been around for a long time. And they've done some things that they were interested in that their audience really didn't like. And talking to Michael, the host of that show, he was okay with that. Like he wanted to keep doing things that he wanted to do. Some people stuck with it. Some people uh, pivoted. They continued to change and evolve. And at some point, you kind of have to do that. You know, like if you've been doing the same show for five years and 500 episodes, it starts to lose some of its luster. I'll, eventually, you just kind of get uh, templative and your show is just a revolving door of book authors who are talking about the book they just released, you know, and it's not that interesting because that same story is on a bunch of other shows too. So if you are interested in putting time in a different way, then I would do that and try to try to keep your audience. Yeah. It looks like you can read these questions here. You want to answer this one from Michael, maybe read out loud. Is podcasting for you a reasonable income producing medium or is or is revenue more focused on covering its own expenses? It's it's uh, for upside. It's been covering its expenses and growing the show. Um, I do hope that creative elements is a meaningful part of my income, and I can spend more time on it. But I mean, if you want the show to produce enough income to actually give you um, live a livable wage, it's got to be a pretty big show, and you got to put a lot of time into it. And it's not going to happen from day one, which is tough. 
Yeah, he also asked about um, sort of maybe professional reach as well as part of that. And I'm assuming that's oh, a yeah. portion that, of That's a huge part of it too. I mean, at the end of the day, I, I want the show to be able to stand on its own and generate income on its own, but it's also a means for getting people aware of all the other stuff that I write and I share and that I do and the services that I offer. Like all of that is a bonus that I expect will have some sort of return. But yeah, it's a mix of like, I know that if this goes well, it can compensate me in these several different ways. It's a, it's a, you know, a mitigated risk in that way. Yep. Uh, what is the top false assumption you've busted after having a show? Man, that's tough. That's tough. Let's see here. Uh, just, just publishing consistently, like, isn't enough. <laughs> <laughs> like your show has to be good enough that you're competing with more than you think, because at the end of the day, people are giving you their attention and that's competing with Instagram. That's competing with Facebook and Twitter. That's competing with Conan O'Brien's show. Like it's, it's more valuable or I, let me say this. It's more reasonable to expect that you can launch and grow and sustain a show that is educational versus entertainment because more and more people like Conan people like Dax Shepard, they have a big name. They have connections, they have budget to put into promoting the show, and they have name recognition already. They have access to really big names in entertainment. You just aren't going to be able to compete on entertainment. And by virtue of having a show that's supposed to be entertaining, you are saying that I'm going to compete with entertainment. So the best place to be, in my opinion, is an educational show that has um, uh, scarce information that people can't find elsewhere. And also you have to have like good personality. For a long time, I thought that production didn't matter that much either but um as more people get into the game and as shows get better and better and you're competing with even educational shows i think production really does matter i thought that having a 90 minute show upside used to be 90 minutes i was like well i listen to really long shows i love long interviews more and more i want to get shorter and shorter interviews i think creative elements right now is about 45 minutes per episode but Honestly, it should probably be more like 30 or 35 if I want it to get as big as it can be. And it's hard because you have guys like Seth Godin who will give you 45 minutes of their time. And you're saying, I'm going to cut out 20 minutes of that because I need an intro and outro. Like I'm going to cut out half the time that I got with Seth Godin. And listeners kind of want that. Interesting. Um, awesome. Anybody else? Uh, questions for Jay? And thanks again, Jay, uh, obviously for spending the time. Um, and this has been super informative to me. I feel like there's a bunch of things that, that I learned. And I think, you know, just seeing the full process and even the production components is, is really fascinating. And I think it just shows like, like anything, when you see stuff that's done well, there's just more that goes into it than, than you think. Uh, but we got another, you know, question or two time for that. And then Jay will have you share where people can find you, uh, what else you're working on, et cetera. Um, Spencer asks, as an educational show, how do you balance commercials and calls to action with content? If you're doing high production, I mean, I would lean on the construct that people know and expect of ad units as kind of the quote unquote bad guy. You know, if, you, if people are used to hearing ads in your show at the pre-roll and in the mid-roll and at the end, there's no problem with you making those your own ads and giving them calls to action. Even before you have sponsored advertisers, you can get you can train people to expect advertisements by having underlying music and saying, this is a promotional message right now. You know, this episode was brought to you by some of the shit that I sell. Um, myself. Yeah. <laughs> that's and that's okay. That's great. Like do that. Um, I wouldn't make it like so overt. I mean, at the end of the day, you have to be providing the listener enough value in what you're saying that they want to listen anyway. But as long as you're doing that, like, yeah, talk about the stuff. Like if it's going to help them, then sure, put that in there. But if you're doing a show because you think that it's going to only lead to sales, the stuff that you're doing, you're probably going to be kind of disappointed because you have to really think from the lens of what will the listener gain out of this without any impact to what will happen to me. Yep, I think it's good philosophy. Uh, what are one or two interesting or different things you want to try in a show that you haven't yet? I've gone back and forth on introducing us into a show or just making a show on it's all on its own. And I think it's a good enough show idea that I haven't put it into shows yet, but also I'm so busy. I don't know if I'll ever make a show out of it, but I basically want to just have what I would call a soapbox question, because what we do at the end of upside sometimes is we'll say, is there anything we haven't asked that we should ask? And we get such interesting responses to that. If we're already getting access to like pretty big name people, I think it'd be interesting to just, 
let them stand on a soapbox for 10 minutes and say whatever they want to say. You know, like, what are people not saying right now that they should be saying? And let them rant about something they really care about and feel strongly about that they don't typically have a platform to do. I think it would be really, really interesting. Totally. Um, okay, let's make this the last one. Uh, Landon Steele asks, uh, what do you think that bigger media podcasts, e.g. Uh, Pod Save America, have resources to do that individual podcasters don't? What would you do differently if you had access to more of their resources? I think it's all about the the creative of the show. I think it comes down to scripting and post-production for more than anything else. Like Some of these shows will spend so much time and have multiple people working on exactly how the script should go the voiceover they have better control of like where they record things so it sounds so so crispy um i mean i was listening to an interview on without fail between alex bloomberg and ira glass you know ira glass like pioneered podcasting and um uh, alex bloomberg learned from him and started gimlet and they were talking about the notes that literally Alex Bloomberg sent some of his first podcast episodes from Gimlet to Ira Glass and Ira Glass would have notes like add two seconds of dead air between this and this, <laughs> like getting that fine grain on pacing and storytelling and cutting out very small things. That's where a lot of these people spend time. Now you have shows like Reply All also from Gimlet that have to put so much time into uh, research. You know, when I showed you that whole Kanban flow of in flight episodes, they have to have so many episodes in flight because they're putting in weeks, months of uh, research and content, like things towards the final story month to month. So that's that's where I think they put a lot of their resources and time and they have people doing sound design so that transitioning between segments, there's custom sound to make you emotionally feel a certain way. You don't even notice it. Good sound design, you don't even notice, but it takes so much time and, and intention to do well. Awesome. Well, uh, you know, this is available after if people want to hit us up at Maker Pad, we can send you the episode to share. I know someone asked about that. Uh, Jay, just thank you so much again. Uh, I feel like I learned a ton. I love how we saw like the full spectrum of, you know, starting the show, getting ratings, getting, uh, you know, what can you do if you have an intense editor that you're working with producing? Um, so yeah, if you just want to share where people can find you, people can listen to your new show, which I think I want to go do right after this. Cause I'm like, I want to hear the stuff we talked about. Um, so, uh, yeah. Do you just want to share whatever your, you know, pitches? Totally. Um, oh, cool. Check, you're sharing some stuff. Here. Check out yeah, yeah. both those links. If you would, if the startup podcast sounds interesting, go to upside.fm or search upside on any pod player. Um, if creative elements sounded interesting, search creative elements anywhere. would love to hear your feedback on that. would love a rating and review on iTunes on that. Um, <laughs> helps a lot, but yeah, follow those things there. Thanks for listening guys. This has been great. And thanks to you, David, because, um, one of my first freelance gigs and the first times I learned about podcasting was working with you on a podcast way back in the day. Probably wouldn't even do it. That's right. Actually, I think this is crazy to me that yes, Jay helped me set up my first podcast like a long time ago. Great memory. I forgot about that. All right, everyone. Thank you so much. Uh, you know, we are back every week with MakerPad talking to experts. Uh, building stuff. Uh, you know, we're trying to do a little bit more episodes like this or workshops like this, where we dive in and, and show like, how are people actually kind of creating uh, the stuff that they're creating behind the scenes. And Jay was kind enough to come on. I hope everybody is uh, staying safe at home, staying sane, uh, you know, <laughs> working from home every day um, and looking forward to catching everybody just online in the next workshop. Awesome. Thanks guys. Cool. Thanks Jay. See ya.